Hi, everyone. So super excited to be here today. Um, we want to jump right into it, right? We want to talk about candidate experience and this buzzword of candidate experience. And when we talk about you know, this buzzword of candidate experience, it's super important. And the reason for that is because it is the one factor that really attracts talent, the right talent to your employment brand. Right, a good experience gets people feeling good about how you treat them when they go through your process. However, a better candidate experience is when you know, they talk about your brand and make recommendations about who you are as an employer. And on the other hand, a really bad candidate experience leaves people talking, um, makes you lose uh, you know, faith in that brand and also as an employer. So we want to jump right into it. Um, we're focusing on the hidden costs of candidate experience. And the reason for that is because when a lot of companies, they don't spring to action until they're actually losing something. So we want to talk today and start off our, our question with the, for the panelists and uh, ask you, what is the, the cost that, that you've seen um, and that, that experience that drove you to make change in your organization? So Brian, we'll, we'll start with you. Okay, so um, I guess from, from my experience, um, when we worked with um, Virgin, um, we went in and uh, Graham Johnson, who was heading up the uh, TA at the time, he said, Brian, I feel like head of rejection. Um, uh, our MPS score is minus 23, um, and we're getting lots of grief. Um, we think there's a problem. Can you come in and help us reject candidates nicer? <laughs> and we were like, okay, this is a bit of a weird request, but, but let's, let's, let's do it. But actually, when we went in, we audited uh, what was going on. We, we mapped the, uh, the candidate experience, and um, something triggered in one of the team's minds. We, we did some further investigating. What we did was we looked into correlating how many of the candidates were actually customers at the time. Um, they were getting 120,000 applications. 18% um, of them were, were, were customers, um, and 6% of those were were uh, so um, turned down by the, the candidate experience, they were going home and, and, and canceling their uh, consumer contract. Uh, and it was costing them millions of pounds every year. Um, so when we, when we first uh, presented that to the, the senior board at, at Virgin, they didn't know what was coming. We'd had it validated with their then um, CFO, Morris, um, ahead of time by two external um, auditors. Uh, and sure enough, the, the, the numbers were true. Um, and it was so weird when we presented it back to them. They gave us a, a spontaneous standing ovation of, of like, oh my God, like, you know, it was like a light bulb moment. Um, so we very quickly moved the MPS score to uh, a healthy positive state, stopped the sort of um, the bleeding, if, if you like. And then we also then started to experiment with uh, turning the 82% um, of, of candidates who weren't customers. Um, obviously, it was a, a, a an opportunity to create a revenue stream, you know, so. Right. Um, yeah, and, and since then, um, to be honest, I'm sick of reading it and seeing people talk about it at conferences and all the rest of it. Um, but it was a light bulb moment for, for us and certainly was for the engine as well. Great, thank you so much. Charlotte, you've had so much experience with, this is your sixth brand that you're, you're working on now, so tell us a little bit about when you realized that cost. I remember, gosh, maybe seven years ago, sitting down with Jennifer Newbill, who was running employer brand at Dell at the time, and she told me this story about a mid-level procurement manager that had come in to interview, and she was really struggling getting the hiring managers to treat candidates with respect. And sure enough, the, for this one, the hiring manager was late, a bit dismissive, probably hadn't reviewed the resume in advance, and the candidate left with a less than stellar, you know, perception of what it would be like to work at Dell, in particular for this manager. He was offered the job and he declined it based on his experience. Mm. You wouldn't think that that would have a huge impact on Dell's revenue. However, he went on to get a job at another company a couple months later, and he was in charge as a procurement officer of procuring millions of dollars worth of computer equipment. Mm. And guess who he didn't award the work to? That has always stood out in my mind. I mean, even the Every single interview, when I work for these large global brands, we're interviewing, we have 10, 15, 20,000 recs open at a time. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them has the impact and the possibility to cost you millions of dollars. Wow. 
That's wild. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Thank you. And how about you, Wendy? Um, so I have been, I've only been with my company for a, a short period of time. Um, and one of the things that they did a few years ago is they brought in an outside, um, they bought, brought in Deloitte to kind of look at what were they doing and how could they improve. Um, Sanford Health has exploded in size. We've doubled in size in the last year. Um, we'll be adding more employees coming and so being able to have that good candidate experience has been so important. So we divided out the recruitment staff to have recruiters who work directly with the hiring managers so we can have build that relationship and talk with them and help them find the right candidate. And then we have specific sourcing people who go out and find candidates for us. So they're going to be the ones that are talking with the career arc people to decide what we need to do. So if I need an RN in Fargo, North Dakota, I call our sourcing staff and say, hey, we're having a hard time filling this one position. And they're the ones that take it out. And it's really been able to, by segmenting that work, we've been able to focus it a little bit better. I'm able to spend time with my hiring managers and get them going in the right direction. And then our sourcing people are able to build that relationship with the candidate and then we work together to, to bring that to fruition. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we um, started doing was that um, your internal candidate experience is also really important, and that's one of those things that we don't always think about mm -hmm. um, because sometimes you bring in the a good person and they're a good match for your company, but maybe they get into the wrong department. Maybe they get in with the wrong hiring manager. And what's the hiring manager do the first time? Let's fire them. Well, maybe we don't want to fire everybody. Um, <laughs> just, just a thought. Because um, you were complaining about being short staff. So we have, our, we have our employee relations team that will talk with the hiring manager and talk about what are the issues, what's really going on, and is it, are they really a bad fit for Sanford or are they a bad fit for you as a department? And so then that um, the employee relations person brings them to our TA team and we try to help them find a position. Um, and so we do this with um, even displaced employees who maybe were shutting down a department or something. So we work with them, we help them, we talk with them about what are they interested in, where can we get them, and who can we get them in front of. We'll get them with the sourcing staff because mm -hmm. they have a broader knowledge of a variety of positions across the organization. So it's really about making sure we keep those good employees, retain that talent. Retain that talent. Um, you know, we don't, what was it, regrettable turnover? Regrettable loss. Regrettable loss. We don't want that um, because there's so many good people out there who are just in the wrong fit job. Great, thank you. It, it's funny, it's very human, right? Yeah. And, and we keep talking about this human interaction that we need to, to feel mm -hmm. that while we're, we're going through this. Um, we, we have an interesting tool here at CareerArc and um, we, we see a lot of these great comments um, and they're very human. So um, I just pulled a couple of them because I found them very you know, intriguing, right? They're really talking about that commitment to caring for people. And these are the people that they rejected. So this is a tool that, um, you know, that, that we found this feedback. This is a candidate making this direct feedback about how grateful they are to have received this job assistance tool and, and feedback about how they can really improve themselves as a person. So it's a very human way to, to reject your candidates. And uh, I, I see great comments all the time. So just had to, just had to share um, because it's, it's not often that, that people are treated this way as they're going through a process and, and they just feel very, very grateful. So um, well, we're gonna jump into a poll uh, with regards to starting a candidate experience, what is stopping you? What's blocking you? What, what, why haven't we started yet? And Brian was so lovely and he's like, I think that I could probably pick which ones are going to be in the top three. So do, do give us your, your input well, here, Brian. I'm scared to guess now, but in the poll, lack of awareness um, and proof that there's a problem. Wow. You know, if, if that was the biggest barrier, I guess it's the easiest one to fix, right? You know, um, create, create new awareness. But um, one thing that we learned the hard way was um, mapping and designing new candidate experiences. Originally, we neglected to empathy map the recruiter and the hiring manager. Um, so you design a stunning candidate experience, which um, in theory is fantastic, especially for the candidate. Um, but without getting the buy-in of the, the hiring managers and recruiters, uh, you know, if it's not practical um, and it's not 
it doesn't demonstrate empathy for those guys uh, or value for those guys, then it's difficult. Um, you know, that's like t very tangible, right? These things are very yeah. tangible. And then, of course, you know, there's the intangible, right? Absolutely. The things that you can't measure. Yeah. So um, question for you guys, you know, what about all of those challenges that you face, right? What, looking back, are there things that you would have done differently in terms of developing, you know, this experience for, for your candidates? Uh, I know, Brian, you mentioned something about, do I say it out loud? <laughs> <laughs> a great campaign that we wanted to share today. This is a campaign that Philips weren't were brave enough to use. And Lisa Collera, who's a fantastic consultant now, she's left, left um, Philips. She was 10 months pregnant. Um, she hated the universe. She was <laughs> incapable of bullshit. She brought us in uh, and said, Brian, we've, we have mapped our candidate experience. It's fantastic. We just need our hiring managers to stop being a dick. <laughs> so we created uh, some training material which was no. be a Hannah, you know, be, be thoughtful, be empathetic, be prepared, be organized, be human, um, you know, be a Hannah, um, be a Hannah, don't, don't be a dick. Um, so, so this is Hannah, this is Dick. Um, you going again? Yeah. Um. <laughs> and essentially it was like, look, you know, this is how we want you to act. This is how we don't want you to act. Uh, and then we, we created a, a little quiz to see how much of a dick you were, how much of a you were. Um, and then material that slowly was designed to um, transition from Hannah and Dick to real hiring managers and putting them in the spotlight and saying, like, we want you to be like these people. Um, so the idea was a bit of fun. Um, quite shocking, get people's attention, but also being really, really straightforward with, look, this is super important to us, and this is the length we're going to to make our point. You know, try and make it easy for them, and also, you know, I think when you're asking a hiring manager to change their behavior, it's really important to um, be very explicit with what great looks like, and then also, don't be afraid to hold a mirror up and say, look, this is currently what you're doing, and this is how it's making people so that was yeah. that was um, a campaign that we designed probably 18 months ago, and um, I am super happy to to have um, now we we just sold that creative last week to a different client, so we're going to see oh, Hannah wow. and Dick actually be used. So stay tuned. Nice, yay! <laughs> we love that. We just yeah. thought that was hysterical. Such a great way to to express that. And Charlotte, I know you you also have so many different things that that you've been involved in. Can you share some of your experience in in, in terms of this hiring manager relationship and how important it is to to make sure they're on board? The hardest part of rolling out an employer brand or candidate experience is the change management bit and getting people to change behavior. So this, to me, is a really great way to help solve some of that awareness in terms of, all right, I'm not aware that there's a problem, but how do I make it fun and enjoyable and be willing to go on that journey with you? I think I've underestimated the complexity of getting recruiter and hiring manager adoption for all of the initiatives that I drive, mm -hmm. so much so that Several years ago at Thermo Fisher, I had spent a million dollars in 18 months developing, at what was the time, one of the world's best employer brands. I brought my whole team together, 150 recruiters from around the world for a two-day training, and I wanted them to get up on stage and role model how to use the stories to better connect with candidates. And I gave them all these materials, and I gave them a library of 40 stories, and they looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> and it was in hindsight, like handing them a scalpel and asking them to perform an abidectomy, like they had never inc incorporated this type of material into their into their job. So I learned a big lesson that day and I've worked differently. So I think making sure that you've got some recruiters that are really close with you that can help test your campaigns before you roll them out to help you with your training, especially my background's internal communications. I didn't come from the recruitment side, so that was a blind spot for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing is, while this is an expensive way to go about it, when you journey map your candidate experience, if you start to empathy map, okay, what's our current process like and how do we make people feel at every stage? How do we want them to feel? And then you brainstorm things that you could do. So the night before an interview, how do you think your candidates are feeling? Could they potentially be a bit nervous? They don't know what to expect. They don't know how to shine. They don't know how to excel in your culture. Could you send them something the night before to help put them at ease? Oftentimes, the stuff that you brainstorm in that moment 
it's really low cost and it's low effort and it makes a huge impact in how somebody feels. Mm -hmm. So just going through that exercise, while this stuff is amazing, um, it can help you get off the ground pretty quickly. Great, thank you. Wendy, do you, do you have a, a similar experience in that? Like that to... Yeah, you know, it, it really building those relationships internally already so that your hiring managers trust you and understand what you're doing and so that you understand what they're really looking for to help with that whole overall experience. Um, there, there's just something about the relationship building. And I, I half joke, half not, you know, I hate networking. That traditional networking, I just, I hate it. And so any way that I can get in to build real relationships with people, you know, going to going to lunch with the hiring managers or um, wh one of the things I did with my last group that was new, I said, well, let's just do a working lunch. And they brought in meal. They brought in the food, which was awesome. So we just sat and talked and got to know each other so that they trust me when I can bring things to them and have those conversations. And they're actually more willing to give me information mm -hmm. so that when we do have those declined candidates, I can give them real information if it exists sometimes it doesn't but you know or if they're the sec if they're the runner up candidate to be able to have that conversation with that person to say hey you know Lindsay really liked you we don't have another position right now but we'll keep you in mind and then working with our sourcing staff to keep them on the loop so that when another position does open up we can get them in and get them in faster that's so great right these silver medalists we talk uh -huh. about this all the time and and Charlotte, we were talking about how do you decline those candidates? How do you let them know? And, and really giving them, you know, humanity, a human touch. And you were mentioning something about your decline letter and, and what you were, were really looking at and evaluating. We are um, implementing Workday at Danaher right now. And we had an opportunity to go through and look at all the ad hoc auto-generated communications that come out and the way we're declining our candidates. And that, well, I hate for people to be declined via email. I'd rather them be declined on the phone and have it be a live experience. The volume makes that impossible for some organizations, especially if you don't make it to the interview stage. So I took 10, 15 minutes and looked at our emails and just wrote them like a human rather than a machine. <laughs> and you'd be amazed how much like, lift that that, that that effort takes and what a difference it can make for your candidates. So look at your letters. Take away, go look at your letters, look at how you're auto-declining folks, and then write it in the perspective that you would like to be declined in. Yeah, no, no robotic uh, communication, <laughs> right? Because yep. you're really dealing with people, and, and we've seen that impact firsthand. I mean, it, and, and it is really about how do they feel throughout the whole process, from that immediate just seeing your brand for the first time, but as well as walking through every single step to even when they exit the organization, mm -hmm. it's super important that they have a very strong, great impression um, and staying connected. We were talking about this last night at dinner as well. Brian had the idea, he's like, I want to start, every time you decline a silver medalist, I want to immediately have a referral program so they're referred into another position in the company. Who's brave enough to create that process? Career no. arc. <laughs> right? There's a referral. There you go. So, but that's a great idea, right? Mm -hmm. It's how do they stay connected and, yep. and what can you do for them, right? Like right. You were speaking to Wendy that you were talking about that you don't want to lose someone that's really important in the organization, how they, how they right. get there. And then, so keeping them in, I love that idea and, and it's super important. Um, thank you for that. And, you know, so as we were talking about quick wins or takeaways and how, you know, what can people walk away with? What can they start right this moment? from this panel, what can they put into action? Do you have any thoughts about those quick wins? What can they do today? Um, my best advice is build that relationship with your hiring managers. Mm -hmm. As you know, if you're in TA or in a different area, making sure that your, the recruiters and the hiring managers have a strong relationship because that's going to facilitate the, the conversation, those difficult conversations around why did you decline somebody and be able to get some real information and do some training and um, that empathy that we talked about because we don't talk about that enough. Right. Very true. For me, I'd suggest that you just start measuring so that you've got a baseline. So putting in a simple NPS metric at the different points of your process will help let you see where you should put your effort. So a quick survey at, after the point of application, after the point of interview, and after the point of offer on a scale of 1 to 10, how frustration-free was this process for you, for example, will start to tell you where you're falling down and where to put your effort. Okay. Without a shadow of a doubt, MPS at every point is, is super important. 
I guarantee, though, if um, if you pull a small team together of uh, hiring managers, recruiters, anyone that touches the the, the candidate experience, and map out uh, all of the um, all of the touch points, and just go through a very simple checklist of how does the candidate feel, what are they thinking, how easy is it to progress, and what's the memorable moment. And then you could look at the practicalities that you just need to endure and work around, uh, and also who's the baton holder, who's responsible at that moment in time. Just by mapping out uh, the answers to, to those simple questions right the way through, I guarantee you'll see quick wins that you can just fix. You know, why are we asking the candidate to fill in that same form with their and there? That's for our convenience, not theirs. How do we change? Um, you know, and then um, one thing we love to do at, at Gage is we try and look at the moments between the moments. So the times of contemplation and um, the times when they're, they're going away making those, those, um, those important decisions on their own, what can you do to influence or support and make the candidate the best version of themselves? Uh, at Virgin, you mentioned like the night before being nervous for an interview. Um, at Virgin, we sent them um, a video of Usain Bolt. And Usain Bolt said, look, success is all about preparation, you know, get a good night's sleep and, you know, give it your all and all the rest of it. And it was what we call just a, a little moment of magic. What was great about that with Virgin is it, it created an int intrinsic link with marketing. So obviously Usain Bolt, the fastest man on the planet, and um, he was the, 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 the marketing um, guy with, with Virgin at the time. We made friends with the marketing department and used some of their assets and, um, you know, treated candidates with the same amount of respect as a, as a customer. Um, you don't all have to invest in Usain Bolt and all the rest of it. <laughs> what are those elements of um, of your brand that you can in, in inject into it? And yesterday I was talking about adversity a lot. So the point about making it easy, um, how easy do you want it? Sometimes you want it to be hard. So if your um, environment and your culture is fast-paced with high pressure intensity all the time, then actually along your candidate journey, it might be that you ask your candidate to do something quickly that's really hard, you know, um, and then you find out whether they're a good culture fit, you know, and, and they do too. Um, so if it's by design, um, you know, you can inject your employer brand really well, um, but just by mapping those data points, you will find quick wins that cost you nothing. Right, thank you. You know, Charlotte, you were mentioning something about you recently changed roles uh, going into that here. Can you share a little bit about that experience? Um, Being a candidate is super humbling, and I knew that I was ready to make a career move about 12 months ago, and I actively interviewed and explored opportunities for six months. And in March, I found myself with three different offers from three different brands, and I wanted to join every single one of those companies for different reasons, and they each had the standout moment in their candidate experience. So one day, I was asked to fly to Bentonville, Arkansas, which I had never been to before, and... They wanted, they gave me maybe 12 hours notice I needed to come out because they had another candidate that they were interested in who had received another offer and they needed to make a decision pretty quickly. And could I get on a flight and go there? Well, San Diego to Bentonville, there's no direct flights. <laughs> and it was a Friday and I was like, all right, I'll go, but I'm worried if there's any sort of delay or hiccup, I'm going to get there really late on a Friday and it was a three-day weekend. Are you sure this is going to work out? And they said, yeah, no problem. We'll make it work. Sure enough, I get stuck in Denver for hours and I was on the phone with the hiring manager and he said, don't worry, Charlotte, like I'm going to come to the airport personally. I'm going to pick you up. We're going to have our interview over dinner. They fed me wine and <laughs> drove me to my hotel, called me to make sure I got home. Okay. The next day, I mean, they really treated me like family and it made me realize I would be part of a family that really cared about me if I had joined that organization. The other one was like the hardest, most challenging interview process I'd ever been part of. And part of my complexity was there was letting them let me work remotely because they wanted me to relocate to Seattle. And as I went out for the interview, I was in a room probably for eight hours with a lunch break. And every interviewer came in with one skill set that they were drilling me on. And they asked me the toughest questions I've ever been asked. But they prepared me all the way through. So the night before they called me, they said, here's how to shine in our interviews. Make sure you don't ever say we. We're not an organization that wants to know about we. We want to all hear about your individual contribution. Mm -hmm. And here's some stuff you should study. And then they said, we also want to let you know that you're the only person interviewing for this. We only interview one candidate. And we set a minimum bar. 
if you pass that bar, we're going to give you an offer. And I want to put time on your calendar today to give you that offer. So before I'd even done my interview, I had a date within three days post-interview that I was expecting a call from a recruiter to get that feedback. Wow. And then they called a date early. Wow. They must really want to do. <laughs> and I was just like blown away by it. So yes. what a great experience. Yeah. All of those. And uh, super important. Wow. Such great examples, too, of, of really humanizing this whole experience. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so before we you know, wrap up, go into Q&A. Um, is there anything that, you know, any other challenges that, that you want to share? I mean, we've talked about it, right? Hiring managers, going through that process, being human, the declined uh, letter, and, and, and making sure that that speaks to in, in a, a human voice. Um, is there anything else that, that, you know, you can think of that, uh, you know, is important to, to share today? So, um, I'll just throw this out quickly. Um, how many of you have applied for a job at your own organization in the last... 30 days? <laughs> Just one. Two. So, two. Two. So in retail, a floor manager will walk the floor of the, the retail store 12 times a day to see what it feels like to be a customer in their own environment. So a really simple way to improve your candidate experience is apply for a job in your own organization and see how it feels. Um, that's a, a super simple tip, but uh, you will pick stuff up all the time. At Danaher, one of the philosophies I've brought into the organization is what's the best candidate experience you can have? And it's not applying for a job that you have no chance of getting or excelling in if you were to be offered that opportunity. So we're retrofitting our value proposition and redoing our employer brand to take a lot of the stuff that Brian spoke about yesterday, but to actively encourage people not to apply if they wouldn't be a good fit. And in order to do that, we have to articulate what our harsh realities are. Mm -hmm. And I think by doing so, I had done this at Magellan Health before I joined Danaher, we saw our quality of application go up 42% within four months by adding that mutual value exchange. Here's what it takes to thrive, and here's what we offer you in return. Most of us leave that on the table, and that simple act of getting someone not to apply who wouldn't fit saves you all the hassle of having to care for declined candidates and reduces your risk. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and you've been talking about that a lot, right, Brian? We mentioned that about give to get mm -hmm. and, and you know, no, no regretfulness, right, and letting go of the, the, the right person in the organization. Yeah. So um, this is great. Thank you so much for all of your insight and knowledge and expertise in the area. Um, we want to open it up to any questions, uh, thoughts from the audience. Janae? Great. This is uh, one of my favorite topics because I think and I, I think it has a big impact and a bigger impact on people's brand than they think it does. And uh, if you take a look at a thousand employees, company, how many people here have a thousand people in their company? So just use, use the math. A thousand employees and 15 percent or 150 people leave a year for whatever reason. Even if you're not growing and you replace those 150 people, and even if they only have 100 applicants per open position, that's 15,000 people, right? 15,000 people that apply to your company. 500 friends for each of those 15,000 people, and you have the ability to upset seven and a half million people a year. Think about that. A thousand person company. This is what you have to tell the people you're trying to convince to bring in uh, you know, a, a quality program. A thousand person company impacts 7.5 million people a year that will have an opinion on your company. Do you want that to be positive or negative when you're trying to bring in new candidates? So what I like about what you've said is, you know, kind of the kindness, the cadence, and the consistency is what we look at. And I'd like, you know, you talked about the hiring manager. I'm talking here about the process. Both of those. The hiring manager needs training for empathy yeah. and training mm -hmm. for skill. Yeah. But the process can cover a little bit of that. And that process is about the kindness is the training, but the cadence and the consistency matter. Talk to me about the 
process and the cadence and the consistency and what you think are best practices in that arena? So the only word I would change there is um, it, it's not candidate process, it's candidate experience. So it, it, has, it, has to be, it has to be with that empathy and it's got to be through the eyes of, of, of the candidate. Um, and the maths on, on those numbers, Robert, are just incredible. Absolutely mm -hmm. incredible. You know? And people talk about experiences when they're super pissed off <laughs> or when they're super um, delighted. So um, the most annoying thing on YouTube at the moment um, for, to watch my son watch on YouTube is this thing about unwrapping presents. <laughs> what is that about, right? So now at Christmas, he unwraps the presents and puts it down and unwraps the other one. I'm like, no, no, you, like, play with the present. You know, it drives me crazy. Anyway, the point of this is um, when we design a candidate experience, the moment of offer is a life the milestone, and we don't celebrate it enough. Why is it a letter? You know, for our clients, we make it t-shirts at Blizzard. We created flip-flops. You know, we we, don't, we we have um, we've got one client. We're building an escape room um, for for the induction. Like if you if you if you don't experience the culture, you literally can't get out. You know. <laughs> to, use, to use Robin's maths, you know, um, and the point of the story about YouTube, like what can you send? your candidates to make that life moment more pleasurable, more sociable and more shareable, because it's, it's a proud moment, right? Mm -hmm. You know, give them something they can open. Like, people don't send stuff in the post anymore, you know? I love getting stuff from the post, something that doesn't say Amazon on it, you know? Um, <laughs> so how can you make that moment of magic more of a delight and more of a shareable moment, and the seven and a half million people get to hear yeah. good things about your organization? Some brands I've seen are sending video offers from the CEO or from a C-suite yeah. leadership. If you're not at a huge company, that's pretty achievable. And just the way that it feels to have an offer, a video offer from your C-suite feels pretty special. And that can be automated as well. Yeah. It can be a congratulations. It doesn't have to be in the name. Right. Right. So at Danaher, for our process, you know, we're a global conglomerate. We have 70 plus thousand associates around the world across 25 different operating companies. And there's a real lack of process when I stepped into the role. So the first thing that we did is a Kaizen. So Danaher is really based on this theory of continuous improvement and the art of a Kaizen, which came out of lean manufacturing in Toyota. So we did a candidate care Kaizen for a couple of days. And you lock yourself in a room with subject matter experts and people with no expertise whatsoever. You map out the current state, and then you look at where you want to go. And as a result of that, you spend the last two days implementing all the process changes in the room because you know once you go back to your day job, it will never get done. And my contribution to that was let's create a candidate promise and let's put that on our career site and let's articulate the expectations on both sides but so people know sort of what we do. And it's a rally cry for all of our recruiters and hiring managers to now live this because it's a public declaration. I like, we're in the process of... of actually implementing Workday as well. <laughs> um, but I like what Robin was saying with the not just experience along with that process because we have almost 180 people in our TA staff. And so to have that consistency of process so that everyone from your um, CNA and administrative assistant has the same experience as the person coming in for the director of finance because you want that's that administrative assistant, that CNA, to have that same feeling, that same excitement of joining Sanford Health that the director of finance does. And, you know, there's going to be differences along the way, but, you know, there's no reason that we couldn't have just a congratulations video linked to a video, a YouTube video even, that comes from um, our CEO saying, hey, welcome. You know, those are little things that are so inexpensive that you can implement tomorrow. Lever's done a lot of great ones. If you just Google what Lever has done, they do gifts of the whole team welcoming people. So they run through the office with crazy signs and excitement. And, yeah, it's very cute. Yeah. Like I said, great content strategy too. Mm -hmm. I mean, on social. Yeah. They all fold back into each other. The only way the caution I would add to that is um, the big risk that we saw early on with, with Virgin of um, sending videos of Usain Bolt and all the rest of it. If you don't get the basics right, that stuff doesn't matter. Right. You know, if you upset a candidate or you ask them to jump through fiery hoops just to go through your process, unnecessary process, and this, that, and the other, like you've got to get the basics right first. Amen.
then you can add that layer of brand, add that layer of fun, mm -hmm. and really look at experience by design. Yeah. Great. Great. How, how soon should you contact people after they apply? Give us your best practices in that area. So I guess it changes at various stages, but um, initially it's, it's an interesting one is because you know, the anxiety builds the longer you, <laughs> you wait, right? Um, but what Charlotte was talking about before is um, the promise of, like the visibility and the clarity of the process I think is, is really important. So if you go through our candidate experience, here's what to expect, set the expectations. So if it's going to be two or three weeks because you're snowed under, just tell them mm -hmm. really early. And now they know. So they, they, just, they haven't got the anxiety of is it going to be today, is it going to be today. So I think, I think setting expectations is super important. And then if you think it's going to be two weeks, tell them three weeks. Under promise, over deliver, right? Um, you know, Because I think every organization is going to be different. But, but setting that, um, that context uh, and expectation, I, I think that would be my... Uh, go to and transparency, mm -hmm. right? Right, letting them know straight yeah. away so there's yeah. no, yeah. I think you should be contacted in less than a week after you've applied, and that contact should say resumes are being accepted until X date. If you're a fit, we'll get in touch with you then, so you have a sense of when it will be shut off. Mm -hmm. When I was at Thermo Fisher Scientific, we had about 70% of the applicants in the ATS go unviewed because the volumes got so extreme after we launched our brand. And those candidates were never spoken to at all. And we learned a lot from doing that. Mm -hmm. After an interview, I'd say within 24 hours, I mean, you really want to know where you stand after you've gone through an interview process. You're likely interviewing with multiple companies, multiple offers coming in. So to be able to keep everything um, in line, I would follow up within 24 hours with next steps. Yeah, great advice. How about you, um, I, I agree with the transparency and helping people understand how long. We have a, um, an initial goal that when you apply, somebody touches your application within 24 hours, 24 business hours. Whether you hear or not, I mean, you get the automated ATS response that we've received it. And I think, you know, when you use an ATS, take advantage of those automated features so that you don't have to sit there and push buttons because we are busy as recruiters, we are busy as, as sourcing staff, but we can still keep people in the loop without pushing the buttons manually. So there's a lot of, um, you know, the bells and whistles that are in your ATS, take advantage of them. Um, I've worked for way too many people that you implement the bare basics of the ATS and then you don't turn on the whistles because you'll do that later. How many people have later come, you know? <laughs> later never happens, right? <laughs> so, you know, and I, where we are with our workday implementation, our leaders are just push, 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 get it, we're getting all the bells and whistles out right now. It's going to feel like a big water dump, fire drinking from the fire hose. But if we do it now, we'll continue with it. So I'm excited to see where some of those processes build so that we can be more transparent in a lot of that. And I think that's, that's key. You know, If you know what to expect, you're not going to have that anxiety. And you're not going to be calling the recruiter every week, <laughs> every day. What's going on? What you just shared is so powerful. I wanted to piggyback on it. Um, I'm formerly at the Muse, and they do a user survey every year. And 70% of the people they survey say they never hear back about a job that they're ghosted. We all know that's impossible. That can't be true. <laughs> because the ATS system sent automated acknowledgments. And so our interpretation at the time of that is that if you can get your candidate experience into those automated messages, it makes a huge difference, whether it's that video or just anything that takes it out of the spam folder and makes it something that, you know, has a personal touch. That's a good point. Yeah. And candidates are now ghosting us. I mean, yeah. I just did a huge, we, <laughs> my first thing at Danaher was to brand a new tech startup um, within our organization, and I had to hire 25 senior IT professionals in Bangalore, new to market, no brand awareness, and the waiting period in India is 90 days after you accept. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the biggest challenge for folks hiring in India is candidates ghost you, they accept, they continue to interview, they get a better offer, you start all over again. So what could we do to limit the ghosting and keep candidates engaged with us because these critical roles had to be filled? The ghosting is working both ways. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. 
Any other questions before we? I guess I do have a comment. Yes. Um, I can be loud too. So we are currently going through a, a process where we're getting a whole new HR software, a HR solution. Uh, we have bits and pieces all over the map, and we're like, we really need something that streamlines it, um, including a better ETS. So when I'm in these meetings, and um, I've been very involved, and so has uh, Nancy, she's my boss. Um, <laughs> we're in acquisitions and development um, with Grand Casino in Minnesota. But anyways, when I'm in these meetings, um, I think payroll hates when I'm in there. Because as soon as the ATS piece comes up, I'm like, okay, I don't care about anything else. Like, I will jump through rings of fire to get applicants. All I want to know is, do your, does your software require a username and password? Because we have all the fun bells and whistles. We're ringing, we're ringing bells. You know, our applicants are getting beverages with koozies that say, my job is cooler than yours. <laughs> we're doing the fun things. We got certificates, blah, blah. It's fun. But that process, I hate it because my ATS requires a username and password. And passwords are like a capital letter, a number, a drip of blood, <laughs> five numbers. Right. You know? And then we have rehires in our area. So then I don't remember my password. So yeah. we're going through it. I'm like, I know I'm creating a black hole for myself here. Mm -hmm. And I'm so surprised that the softwares out there that are like, yes, a username and password is required. Yeah. And I'm like, but why? Why? I don't care. Like, all I care about is their name and their phone number. Am I wrong in this? I totally feel like if you're requiring a username and password in your application process, you're an idiot. I truly believe that. Um, so I cannot believe if you're creating a software, don't do that, people. Uh, because it's so annoying. We don't care. We just care about their name and their phone number. So I just want to know, am I wrong in this? Do you, I think in, in 2019, nearly, nearly 2020, in this day and age, technology is supposed to be an enabler not a prohibitor. Yeah. So I think you're absolutely spot on. And there is technology out there that you can actually apply for a job with one click. No username or password. Exactly. Yeah. I'm like, I'm a one click person, people. And they're all like, this girl. <laughs> apply for a job at Netflix. It'll yeah. take you 30 seconds. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Well, okay. thank you so much. We, we have to wrap up. Thank you so much for your time, your expertise, uh, all the insight that you shared with us.